Greetings, I'm Shad, and it is time to have a very close look at Kaer Morin from The Witcher 3. Now, of course, the very first thing that has to be mentioned and addressed is the horrible state of disrepair that this castle is in. It is just a mess, and I'm guessing from many a past battle. And of course, its current state would definitely negatively affect its defensive capabilities, but it's easy enough to infer what this castle would have looked like at its peak or if it was repaired, because it would be unrealistic if I was to rate how effective, defensible, or realistic this castle is in the state as it appears in the game. So I'm going to be reviewing it as if it was how it was supposed to look, but having said that, even though I'm going to pretend that certain you know, parts of the castles and towers are repaired and back at 100%. I'm not going to ignore any flaws that are actually in the castle or pretend that they aren't there, like I am going to pretend that the damage on the castle isn't there. If there's a part on the castle that is actually done incorrectly, it's a flaw in design, or if it is unrealistic, I'm going to point it out. So with that out of the way, let us begin, and I'll start with Care Morin's layout, and I actually have a lot to say about it. To make a broad statement, it is beautiful, okay? Like, absolutely beautiful. Why? Well, what we see here are three external baileys, each one self-contained and locked off behind a gate. This is beautiful castle and defensive design. If the enemy ever breaks the outer gate, they still have to deal with two more additional gates, which forces the enemy into a funneled set position to which you should be able to rain down death upon them. This is something that I've repeated quite often in all my castle reviews. But we do run into a bit of a problem here, and it is that the castle walls are not effectively designed to attack enemies on the inside. What am I talking about here? Well, it has no inwards facing battlements, and the access to the walls are completely undefended. Now this is not an unhistorical thing, you'll actually find many historical castles that had what I consider to be a bit of a flaw in their design. As to how much of a flaw it is, it is debatable, because there are many castles, okay, that have such an impenetrable position that it is almost unthinkable that an enemy would actually be able to breach one of the outer walls, or indeed the outer gatehouse. And so because of that, I can understand the mentality of, well, what what's the point of having internal facing battlements and also blocked off and defended access to the walls? And Kaer Morin kind of follows that same philosophy. The issue that kind of arises then, if you are so confident that an enemy wouldn't be able to breach your outer wall, why then have you subdivided your internal baileys? By doing that, it is kind of an acknowledgement saying, well, we do expect the outer gatehouse or an outer wall to be breached, therefore that's why we are subdividing it. Which means if they ever take one of the external baileys, they still need to deal with breaking through another gate. And if they have foresight enough to do that, that they are actually actively planning and preparing for one of these areas to be breached, why then have they not prepared the actual walls themselves to be able to defend themselves against attacks from the end? Inside. How it is currently set up in Kaer Morin is if you take a bailey, you will be able to take some of the external walls of that bailey with a bit of a fight. The defenders can still try and defend those walls, but if an enemy breaches the outer gatehouse and they're trying to defend the first bailey, they don't have any cover from crenellations and the staircases that lead up to those walls are not blocked off in any way, they're completely open. And so the only advantage that the defenders have on these walls is height. The attackers can shoot at them pretty much just as easily as the defenders can shoot back down and push up that staircase as well. Now, now remember, as I have said, this is also done on historical castles. There are many historical castles that have no internal facing battlements, but there are historical castles that do. Why? Because it is a more effective defensive principle. Remember, layers of defense. If you have an enemy that has breached one of these baileys, you do not want them to be able to take the walls surrounding it. In fact, you want that bailey to be as much a death trap as anything else. Because if you have the walls self-contained from the bailey, so access 
blocked off by either doors or walls with internal facing battlements, well that bailey will become an absolute kill zone for anyone, any enemy that falls within it. And so this isn't an unhistorical flaw in Kaer Morhen, and indeed I find it difficult to call it a flaw because it would only exist if the enemy is even able to breach one of the external walls or outer gatehouse, and Kaer Morhen's position, it's on a raised high up position which makes it very difficult for any enemy to assail the wall. You wouldn't be able to bring a siege tower to it. I do think the nearest flat terrain is close enough to be able to set up trebuchets or catapults to try and take out some of the walls, but that is by no means a guarantee that you'll be able to demolish castle walls. In fact, I think that most people actually think that these things, trebuchets and catapults, are far more effective than they actually were. If you could demolish any castle by just whipping out these siege engines, well then, it would have been done far more often. But I do give Care More and points for having a very effective position. But the next part about it is this back cliff that is right behind it. I just don't know how easy it would be for an enemy to climb that cliff and engineer some type of landslide. Or or if the castle would be at risk to things like avalanches or not. So I'm just not 100% confident in how secure it is with this big mountain behind it. Now let's have a look at the gatehouse. And the gatehouse is a bit of an interesting topic. Like, it, ha it does some things really right, yet so there's some missed opportunities here. Now let me just state that not every historical gatehouse had two portcullises, a front one and a back one. Those that did were far more effective in my opinion, because you want to make it as hard as possible for the enemy to be able to break through this entry point. And the entry point of a castle is essentially its most vulnerable place. Therefore it should be the most defended and protected. And Kaer Morhen has this, which is beautiful. It has a drawbridge, though I think the bridge part has been replaced with a more, more permanent bridge, but it is obviously made to be able to have a proper drawbridge. And then it has its portcullis, and if you, the enemy was ever to break through it, they would be inside the gatehouse and have to deal with the second one. And this is where we come to a very big problem. Okay, say the enemy breaks through the front gate, okay, and now they're in the gatehouse, and this is the perfect opportunity to destroy the enemy in the gatehouse if you can actually shoot at them. Inside the gatehouse, there's nothing for the defenders to actually be able to shoot back at the and the attackers. There's no arrows for them to be fired at, and there's no murder holes. This renders the effectiveness of having two gates to this gatehouse completely void. I mean, once they're in the gatehouse, this is the point where you should be able to destroy the attackers. But you can't! There's nothing here! The attackers could just sit down for a cup of tea while the defenders would be up on the top of the gatehouse and around it saying, you know, we really should have put some arrow slits on here. Yeah, yeah you're right. I blame Geralt. He said he didn't like people perving on him when he'd take the bath. Well, that's just his fault for being so attractive. And so it's almost like that the game developers, or whoever designed this castle, made the gatehouse to have two entry points because that's what, you know, histori many historical castles had. Two, two entry points to a gatehouse without properly understanding the why this was done. Because if the enemy can actually breach us out a gatehouse and then not be attacked while they're inside the gatehouse, they effectively have a rally point for their assault. They're fully protected. Of course, the defenders can try and shoot at them through the second portcullis, but it's easy enough to set up barriers or something so that will block arrow fire and such. So yes, unfortunately, this was a big fail. Another thing that's odd about this gatehouse is the fact that I can't find the windlass for these portcullises, which effectively means they shouldn't be able to be raised. This mistake was actually also made on Skyhold in Dragon Age Inquisition, but in the process of making that video I forgot to mention it, but I'll mention it here. What I will say is that it does look like there used to be an additional floor within this gatehouse, and if there was a floor here that has since fallen through because of the disrepair that Kaer Morhen is in, well the missing murder holes and windlass could have been located on that floor. The problem is there's no way to confirm this, and also, if there was a floor here, there should be doors on that level providing access to it from the outside. And looking up, we can't see anything to indicate this. Okay, so that was the gatehouse. Now don't worry, there is still stacks of things to love about Kaer Morhen, okay? One of the things that, ah, oh, I just, you know, loved so much, okay, is that the internal walls of this castle have been painted. Have a look. See how they've been painted? This is a profoundly accurate thing, and I don't think I've seen it in any other video game castle. You see, the people who lived in castles were generally rich, and when someone 
visited them in their castle, they wanted those people to know that they were rich. So they wanted their wealth to be seen. And one of the things that they did is that they plastered everything, often quite garishly, with bright colours, patterns, designs, paintings, murals, you name it, it was there. Unfortunately, there are very few examples of it. I mean, there are more modern examples, like what you can see in Neuschwanstein, but Neuschwanstein was built more recently, yet it still gives a good idea of what the internal castles would have looked like. Probably not to this level, but definitely paintings and murals and colours and such like that. The idea that the medieval period was drab, grey, brown and dirty is an absolute load of bull. Even though London was a pretty dirty place, it didn't mean people didn't like to bathe or to just happily walk around covered in crap. Of course not. And if you were rich, one of the signs of you being rich was being able to afford expensive dyes or artists to paint your dwelling. And when it came to their homes, such as castles, it wouldn't be stone. Oftentimes, they would actually plaster the inside and whitewash it and then paint it. This is another reason why being an artist in this period could actually be quite the money-making job. And I love that Kaer Morin, especially in their large kind of Great Hall section, they have these big murals. Ah, oh, so good. Awesome. So out of anything, Kaer Morin should get massive points for this glorious bit of medieval authenticity. I also love the attention to details here in this castle, such as the stonework around any of the archways, window frames, everywhere. Just beautifully done. And the massive fireplace in the Great Hall is just awesome. The external design of the keep is actually really well done and really practical. You have a square back section with a barbican kind of sticking out in front, with a large side tower that accommodates for some of the larger bedrooms in it. Another thing that Kaer Morin does perfectly is the size of the Merlons. Head height, that's exactly what they're supposed to be, big tick. The next part is both a hit and a miss, and that is the machiculations. In some parts of the castle, it actually has machiculations, but in other parts, it doesn't. And that I just, I don't understand. If they were mindful enough to actually do them accurately in some parts, why on earth didn't they do them accurately in all the parts? And in fact, in the places where they do do them accurately, I really like their design, the way that they've been executed. They were even mindful enough to put a base block of stone that bridges the gap between each corbel which is absolutely what needs to be done to make a proper matriculation because this is stone that is essentially hanging in the air so it needs support and if you don't have a base brick that spans that entire gap the stone is just going to fall through and collapse and they did that here yet they didn't actually have the open space the actual matriculation all over the castle it just doesn't make sense did they get lazy? And you might think, well, they just don't have the matriculations on the areas where they wouldn't be useful. Really? Really? The purpose of a matriculation is to solve the problem of angle. If you're on a wall and you're protected by a battlement, there is only so much of an angle that you can shoot down at to the point where if an enemy runs right up to the wall and puts their back against it, that can actually give them full cover from you above. So what a matriculation is supposed to do is to give the defender on the wall the ability to shoot directly down at anyone who gets so close to the wall. And any external wall, okay, no matter what it is, any enemy can try and run up these steep inclines to get right next to the wall. And in many of those locations where the matriculation should be, it's being filled in on Kaer Morin. And then there are two absolutely perfect locations on this castle for matriculations. And not only do they have, you know, provision for matriculations and that have been filled in and they haven't taken opportunity for that, not only is that not done, there's not even provision for those matriculations, it's just sheer flat wall right up to the battlements atop, and that is on the second and third gate. If you have a look at the second and third gate, it's just sheer wall right up to the battlements above. These areas here are the 
perfect locations to have matriculations, because it is these areas on the castle that if an enemy ever was to breach parts of the castle, it is these areas where they would have to come to to try and get to the next section. Whereas on the external walls, it's, you know, just in case, it's a maybe. But there's slim chances that an enemy would ever come to these parts on the walls, but on gates, absolutely! It is the gates that are, you can be pretty guaranteed that an enemy might try and uh, attack. Therefore, it is those locations where you want those matriculations. But here, they are not there at all. At least on the third gate, there are inside facing battlements, which just confuses me again. It means that the designers of this castle were aware of some of these principles, but just didn't employ them on the whole castle. The next thing that is uh, quite a big fail, in my opinion, on Kaer Morhen, is uh, because some of these, you know, parts of the walls and towers are in disrepair, we can actually see how thick they are. Exactly! And they are not thick enough! Have a look, they're only half a meter thick, and that is nowhere near thick enough! Walls of this thickness will not stand up against catapults and trebuchets, which probably explains why so many of them are in ruins. Here is a layout of a real castle, specifically Carnarvon Castle, and have a look at how thick these tower walls are. In most cases, they are as thick as the main walls themselves. Why? Because castles are supposed to be impenetrable, okay? They are not supposed to be easily demolished by rocks thrown at them. And one of the most direct ways you can design a castle to be able to defend against that is by making those walls thick. This is a very important quality of nearly every proper castle. And the fact that these walls are so thin, my goodness, it almost disqualifies it from being a castle in my opinion, because these walls would be so easily destroyed. I'm not going to, alright? I will still call it a castle, but seriously, if this was real, if Kaer Morhen was real, well then in that case, you could definitely demolish these towers at least, with catapults and trebuchets. And those catapults and trebuchets might actually be as effective as many people suppose that they are, when in reality against real castles, no, demolishing castle walls is a far more difficult task than many people think. Now of course the flat straight walls that run in between the towers, they are thick enough, okay, no complaints there, but the tower walls, no. There's another part where the design of this castle is both done correctly and incorrectly, which it confuses me again because it really seems the designers knew knew what they were doing, yet if they did, how did they make these mistakes? And it's the matter of vaulted ceilings. If you are on any floor above the first floor and you want to have a stone floor for these higher levels, the only way to do that is to have it vaulted underneath. A flat stone floor cannot support itself in any other way, and they've done that accurately in many parts of the castle, especially the Great Hall. The Great Hall is just this arrangement of vaulted ceilings. Yet in parts of the castle outside, we have stone floors that are supposed to be supported by timber beams. No, all right, no, that's, no. I mean, we can do this kind of thing with steel reinforced concrete, and then you have a stone-like, you know, floor that's able to support itself, but stone bricks held together with mortar? This type of floor is architecturally impossible. Okay, so we are reaching the end of this close analysis of Kaer Morhen. And look, even though I've been pointing out a lot of inaccuracies about Kaer Morhen, I do want to say, overall, I am of the opinion that this is a far better designed castle than many I have seen in the past. Its external layout with the three self-contained baileys is just glorious, okay? And the gatehouse could be absolutely awesome. Unfortunately, there's some big flaws with it. But on the most part, it's a good castle, okay? And the last thing that I want to address is the internal layout. Now, it might take too long to explain the exact reasons why, but let me just say and try and give some explanation that the internal layout of Kaer Morhen is absolutely nonsensical and very unrealistic, but it has been specifically done for the same reasons as the layout of Skyhold in Dragon Age Inquisition. It was for gameplay mechanics. And so perhaps go watch my video on Skyhold because I explain a bit of the ins and outs there. And to touch on it briefly here, is that the waste of space within this keep is atrocious. No castle architect in his right mind, historical or otherwise, would ever allow for such wasted space when you could use this room to create so many more bedrooms. 
greeting halls, dining halls, uh, storage rooms, sitting lounges, libraries, servants' quarters, kitchens, undercrofts, dungeons. There's just so much. You see, because rooms are useful. They are very useful. And the more rooms that you can fit in of decent, adequate size, the more you fit in. That's just common sense in regards to architecture. But in terms of a game, it makes navigating through places very difficult because the camera gets hooked in on things, and it's also much easier to get lost. So I'm not saying the game developers should have done this differently, I'm pointing it out so you know the difference between realism and fantasy. If Kaermoran was actually real, there would be so many more rooms in this place. And only one or two of the rooms, like the side tower rooms, would be as big as they are shown in the game. All the other levels would be internally divided into multiple rooms and you wouldn't have so much vertical wasted space Like all these stairwells that run up these towers to the upper rooms. No, you would have floor after floor after floor Gee, you could fit almost three to five extra stories here and still have ample headspace to spare Then of course there are so many places in the castle that are inaccessible Now there are doors that said locked when I tried to open them So they might have been opened if I played further into the game but then there are other places that just have game walls that you can't walk past and simply are completely inaccessible or are unfilled out where they would have been if it was real. So yes, just saying that to make proper note of it. But that really is it. These are all the observations that I have made when taking a very close historical, realism and practical look at Kaer Morin from The Witcher 3. How effectively it is designed as a castle and what's right or wrong about it. I really do hope you guys have enjoyed. It has been by far the most requested castle for me to take a look at. Many of you were expecting it to be mostly perfect in its design. I'm sorry if I've disappointed you. I'm just being real here, calling out what is wrong, where it's wrong, but what is right, where it is right. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, until next time, farewell.